Welcome, let's get started. I'm Craig Bolden, I'm the Associate Dean for Academic Affairs here at the Batten School, uh, and I'm pleased to welcome Coach Steve Swanson uh, to the Batten School. Um, Coach Swanson is a graduate of Michigan State uh, with a master's degree from Iowa. Uh, as some of our post-grad students would attest, it's good to do something sometimes between your undergraduate and your master's degree. For Coach Swanson, that was a professional soccer career. Um, he uh, started his second career then after leaving Iowa um, and became an enormously successful head coach of women's soccer uh, at Stanford, Dartmouth, and Virginia, leading each of those schools to multiple conference championships. Um, he's helped with the development of young players with the U.S youth national teams, and has also led the uh, sport's most elite players, including as assistant coach for the U.S. national team that won the World Cup this past summer. Um, at UVA, um, he's had tremendous success as well, including this year when the women's soccer team is currently ranked number one uh, and is making a nice run in the NCAA tournament. Um, but we're delighted that Coach Swanson can take time from his busy schedule to join us here. So please join me in welcoming him to Baton Hour. Appreciate it. I think, can you hear me all right? Okay. Well, thanks for having me. It's, uh, I am a physical educator. That's what I call myself. I'm a physical educator. I'm very proud of that. I think physical education nowadays is, uh, seems to be dwindling, but uh, I, I, hope, I hope that uh, as we progress here in the future that uh, physical education stays around because I think there's a lot you can learn from it. Uh, this will probably be the closest I come to a teaching classroom, but, uh, but I have my own, my, own, my own classroom outside. But, um, this has been fun for me to kind of go back because uh, I'm one of the few uh, people that were involved with the U.S. national team who had another job. And uh, so uh, once the World Cup was finished, I literally got on the plane at four in the morning the next day and left. And so I really haven't processed it. But uh, I thought the first thing I'd do is show you a video. Uh, this has never been shown before. So this was after the World Cup. Uh, our video people put this together. And uh, they... Uh, this is kind of a snapshot of the whole tournament, so this will be a good intro.
A couple things I should mention in that uh, film are Captain Christy Rampone. She was being carried off by the team because that was her 40th birthday. So you think about that, 40 years old, and she's still playing uh, at the highest level. It's pretty impressive. Um, we always used to get uh, clips from different celebrities every game, and we would always put those on video. So you, you saw a conglomeration of some from Dick Vitale, who he grew up in Detroit, so he was, I, I knew who that was. Some of the players didn't know as much of, but um, and uh, but anyway, I think you know, for for us, there's there's some, and you might find this, you know, there's some simplistic, I think, lessons um, that 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 were learned, and I and I I'm going to touch on maybe three of them that I think over the course of time that we work with this team. Um, were, was evident for us. Um, for us, there was one goal, and that was to win. So it was pretty, pretty easy. I mean, for other organizations, they may have different goals. But for us, it was to win the World Cup. That was really much, pretty much the only outcome. Uh, we, we've always been one of the top teams in the world in, world, in women's soccer. And uh, so it was, uh, it's a lofty goal, especially now um, with, with so many more teams playing uh, competitive soccer around the world. Um, before I talk about some of the lessons that we learned, I think you should, it might be good to go over the journey a little bit, because I, th I think it's important you kind of realize how big this is. This was the seventh Women's World Cup. So they happen every four years. So this was the seventh, started in 1991. The United States won in 1991 in China, and uh, they won again in 1999. So the United States hasn't won in 15 years, didn't win in 15 years. So it's been a long haul. There are 134 teams represented over six confederations. So different confederations, 
Asia, Africa, CONCACAF, which is North America, Central America, and the Caribbean states, uh, Common Ball, which is basically South America, uh, Oceania, UEFA, and then the host nation. Now, I put, these, I put these by them because these are how many spots each of these confederations get. So if you look at our confederation, we have three and a half. What's it mean, three and a half? Well, three qualify, but there's an extra one. If Trinidad and Tobago, who came in um, fourth in our region, they had to play off against the common ball or the South American group, which was Ecuador, and Ecuador actually beat them um, in aggregate. So there's a home and away. So that's how they, they get that last spot. The host nation, Canada, um, always gets an automatic bid. Okay, so that, that's, that's the tournament in a nutshell. It's a little different this year in that um, 24 teams went to the, to the finals. Okay, so of the uh, 134, 24 teams end up going. There's 52 matches. This is up from 16. Okay, this is up from 16. And I put 23 strong at the beginning of the um, presentation because in World Cup play, you are allowed to have 23 on your roster. Okay, that's how many players are on your roster. So in the Olympics, which is coming up this, this coming year, um, it's only 18. So it's a little different as far as that goes. Uh, we were in uh, Group D, which, yes, you could call that group, group of death. Um, there's always one group that's the hardest, and by far ours was. So I put these numbers by that. That's the seedings of every team, the FIFA ranks of each team in the bracket. So we were number two. Sweden was number five. Somehow Brazil ended up getting a, a seeded spot. And Sweden did not, did not, even though Brazil was lower in terms of their seeding going into the World Cup. Australia was so, so you have three top ten teams in one group. And Nigeria, if Nigeria was in another group, they could have easily gone on um, to, to compete in the quarterfinals, I think. If they had the right draw, they could have. Um, so they're a very good team. What you may not see in this group is these, these four teams, probably in my opinion, and I did all the scouting, these four teams were probably the fastest teams in the World Cup, and they also had the best attacking transition. They were probably the best attacking transition teams in the World Cup. So for us, um, we had our hands full right from the start. Um, group stage, I think it's important you realize this as well. It's determined by points, whether you go on or not. So you get three points for a win, and one point for a draw, and zero for a loss, okay? Um, in this particular World Cup, they took four third-place teams. So even if you finished in third place, there's a chance that you would go on. Sweden actually went on in our bracket as a third-place team. Okay? But it's on goal difference. So in every game, in every game that you play, it matters how many goals you score, and also it matters how many goals that you give up. And so you have to be aware of that, and your players have to be aware of that. Um, and then if, if, if it's tied after goal difference, then it goes to goals scored. And then if it's tied after that, believe it or not, they draw lots to see who goes through. So how about that for finding your fate in the World Cup? The knockout stage, it's 90 minutes. And then if, they're, if it's tied after 90 minutes, there's 30 minutes of overtime, mandated 30 minutes of overtime. College soccer is a little different. It's, it's a golden goal. Here, it's, it's 30 minutes. And then it, if, if that's not resolved, then it's on penalty kicks. So. The challenges for our team in particular in this cycle was this. We, had a, we hired a full-time coach four years ago, and they fired him in the beginning of 2015. So all that time that was spent trying to prepare a team and get a, getting a team ready to win it was kind of thrust. We were thrust into a different situation because we only had one year. So if you look at that, we had to pick our roster. Um, which was difficult for a lot of reasons, okay? We had an older age team. I mean, a lot of our players are getting a little older. Some of them now have retired. Um, so that was a challenge for us. The year was a challenge for us. And in this particular uh, World Cup, we were not only the, in the toughest group in the group stage, but we also had the most travel. So we traveled from uh, New York to Winnipeg, Winnipeg to Vancouver, Vancouver to Edmonton, Edmonton to Ottawa, Ottawa to Montreal, Montreal back to Vancouver. Okay, and we had to play seven games in 30 days. So there's a lot of challenges for us, but that was the journey. Okay, that was the journey. So one of the first lessons I, I would say is, and I think it was true for ours, is have a plan. So you need to have a plan. We had to have a plan, especially in the amount of time that we had. We had to work the plan. Uh, 
we had to adjust the plan and we had to believe in the plan. And I put believe in there because I don't think, to me, enough leaders don't put enough belief in the plan. And what was difficult for us is the plan constantly changed. And you can imagine in our world with athletics, players get injured, okay? Things happen in the game. Uh, we might try something um, in terms of how we believe a team should play and it might not work, so we have to adjust to that. So you have to, you have to leave, I, I think there's, in our country, I believe, there's not enough time to think with your team or think with your organization. Think about your strengths, think about your weaknesses. How do you adjust that? How do you go with that? So this was the first thing. Our planning, it revolved around this, and this is a difficult thing to read, but this is actually all the matches in the World Cup. So here are the different venues, okay? Here are the different group games, when they're played. These are the rest days, okay? All the way through on to the semifinals and the finals, okay? So we were in Winnipeg to start off. These were our two games. So we played two games in Winnipeg. You see that there? Then we traveled to Vancouver, all right, to play our last group stage. And then from there, depending how we finished, then we, went, we started to move all over. So you can see the different rest days in here. These are all the groups. And then you can work your way all the way down to the, to the finals. All right, so planning was a big thing. This is, we kind of worked from this and worked backwards in terms of our plan, okay? Uh, this was our schedule, just so you get an idea of, of the schedule. So I, I came in in May of 2014. We played France twice in Tampa and Hartford. Uh, we played Mexico as well during the summer. But for all practical purposes, it started in October in World Cup qualifying. We had several different camps before this, but there were three weeks. We played in Kansas City, Chicago, and Washington, D.C., and the finals of the CONCACAF uh, tournament were in Philadelphia at the end of October. So I was, try I was doing two jobs at one time. I was, doing, I was flying out to these, and then I was flying back for our games here at Virginia, um, and it was a busy fall, to say the least. Um, December, we went to Brazil for three weeks, four matches there, okay? And again, we're trying to play competition that was going to help us determine our team. Um, this was a difficult one because you can imagine our players had been playing from January to October. They didn't do much in November. They're used to not doing much in December, and now we're sending them to Brazil to play. And we were not fit. We didn't have a particularly good tournament there, but I think it was a very valuable tournament for us. And then we started in earnest. Once we qualified here, we started in earnest um, in January to, to solidify the team. The roster for the World Cup, it doesn't have to be the same roster that you qualified with, and it wasn't. So you can automatically, so it's very competitive to make the team, both for the qualifying and for the World Cup. So we had a three-week training camp in January in LA. Then we went for two weeks to France and England. We played France, we played England, came back, went back a week later to Portugal for three weeks for the Algarve tournament which is a big tournament that involves most of the top teams in the world. Then we went to LA for two more weeks. Then in May, we set out on the send-off series, which was a series of three games prior to us leaving for Canada. So we went to San Jose and played Ireland, came back to LA, played Mexico, played Canada in a closed door scrimmage, went to New York and played South Korea. Uh, and then in June, it was four weeks on the road, seven matches in 30 days. So it's a, so it's a long, Trek, a lot, of, a lot of time away from their families. Some of them have kids. The kids were with them. Some of the husbands, husbands were with them at different times. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's a difficult road. So there had to be a lot of planning in here. I just put all the things that you have to plan for. For us, it was a style of play. What formation were we going to play, both in attack and defense? The roster, who was going to start? You get three subs in, in international soccer. So college soccer is vastly different, OK? So you get three moves during the course of a 90-minute match in international soccer. That is it, okay? So you have to think about that in the way you play and how you play. Um, the roles of our players, the periodization of fitness and strength, uh, set plays, the processes that you involved. Our process, if you looked at that um, chart about when our games were, our processes were two days before the game, we would have a, a scouting report. So I would do the scouting reports, and I would give that two days before the match. The day before the match would be our game plan. So what were we trying to do before the, in, in light of the, the, the scouting report, in light of our opponent, what were we trying to do in, in the game? And then the day of the game, we would do a summary of that. So it was a very quick summary, and we'd do a, a highlight video, motivational video. 
So that was kind of our processes each game as we led into the World Cup. So we had to do that beforehand. Uh, the surface, I'm sure you, you might have heard if you're familiar with the World Cup, this was the first time they've ever done uh, a World Cup on artificial turf, uh, artificial turf, which was difficult. I will say this, we never trained, we never trained on the same turf, the same quality of turf or the same turf in our training and our games in Canada. Never, it was never the same turf, always different. And that, that had an effect. Sometimes it would be water turf, and believe it or not, water turf is vastly different than dry turf. Okay? If, you, if, you, if you haven't played on that, you will know. Okay? So these are, again, some of the challenges, some of the things we had to plan for. Um, the matches, the quality of our opponents, um, that was something we had to, to, to replicate as well. And then we also, there was a pro league going on in the summer, last summer, and, and so we have to qualify, you know, our players not only have to play a little bit in the pro league, but they have to prepare for the World Cup. So we had to deal with what we called gap plans, where they might go back in to their pro team for a week or two in order to play for that and then come to the World Cup. So these, again, challenges that we had to deal with. Um, some other things we had to plan for, we, we had a chef. Um, some, some teams don't, don't have chefs, but we, we brought a chef with us. We thought that was important, so she would meet us. She would come to Winnipeg two days before we would get there, uh, delegate to the staff there uh, the kind of meals we wanted, what we, before games, after games, those kinds of things. So again, this is all planning. This is all part of the plan. Uh, she, would, she was fantastic. Um, meeting rooms, we would wallpaper our meeting rooms. In every hotel we went, we'd wallpaper our meeting rooms with quotes, things that would motivate our players. Their individual hotel rooms had fat heads of them at times. Um, different things to motivate them. Um, coaches never had fat heads. Um, but, uh, but that was just all part of the, the little details that we worked out in terms of the planning um, for us to be as prepared as possible. So, um, little things matter. I think this is important. This is another lesson. Um, I've been involved in two World Cups. I was the head coach of the Under-20 World Cup in 2012 that was in Japan. And the minute we won that championship, I said, every single thing we did leading up to that mattered. And I would say the same thing here. Um, the little things do matter, especially in our world. So I'll give you an example. We played Sweden in group play, and we ended up tying that game zero to zero. And if you think about, when I go back and I talk to you a little bit about how you advance and how you win your group, okay, there are certain instances. We did some corner kick defending work, and I think you maybe saw in that, that warm-up, I'll show you again, where one of our players, who's a post player, her job is to kind of cover the goalie, and we would have lost the game had she not done her job. We would have lost that game, and we would not have finished top of the group had we lost that game, and it would have been a much harder road to winning the World Cup. For us, there was no other recourse. We had to win our group. That's the way we felt about it. It would have given us the easiest and best path to the final. So that particular play she made was critical to our success. And you might think, oh, she got lucky. No, that wasn't luck. We practiced that. We trained for that. We worked on that, and I'll show you that. In Germany, against Germany in the semifinal, I had watched hours and hours of tape. My, my job, basically, whenever I went to these countries, France, England, Portugal, you might think, oh, he's, 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 he gets out, he gets to really see everything, go surfing and all this stuff. Basically, I got used to my hotel room. I was in my hotel room a lot and I was watching film. So the one thing we recognized as the staff when we watched Germany play, and if you go back and watch Germany play leading up to this game, you will see their goalkeeper, when she took goal kicks, kicked the ball twice, twice in the four games that she, they played up until that point, okay? Twice. So in their philosophy, the way they like to play, they like to build out of the back. So what would happen, because Germany is such a strong team, most teams would drop back and allow them, their goalkeeper, to play the ball out and start their play. Okay? We did not do that. We did not give them that opportunity. It's, one, it's a mentality thing. We didn't want them playing the way they normally play. And so, now, small thing, but in, in the age of, of these games being so close and there's not, difference, there's not much difference between the teams, we thought that was a critical factor. So their goalkeeper, we forced their goalkeeper to kick the ball out, and she's not very good, and we're pretty good in the air. We're pretty good in the air, and that made a difference for us. We also had a set play, and most of people know Morgan Bryan. Morgan played here at Virginia for us. Um, she's a tremendous player, and she played in this game, 
and one of her jobs was to be a zonal marker in the defending on free kicks that go into the box. And uh, we had to change something at the very end, and she ended up marking probably one of the best headers in the world in Alexandra Pop for Germany. And if you watch the game, you know Morgan got, got hammered. They both collided. Um, but again, if Morgan doesn't make that play, it's a different game, okay? And so again, once again, in this game, the little things I think mattered. And the last one um, was, I think if you saw the final, how many of you did see the final? Raise your hand. So you saw the final, you know what kind of, we had a dream start. Um, we scored two set play goals. And again, some people may say, well, did you work it? Yes, we actually put both of those set plays in the day before the match, okay? We worked on those the day before the match. Now, they didn't come off the same way as they did the final. <laughs> And, they, and sometimes, 90% of the time, they don't. But in that particular game, in that particular uh, sequence, they did. So I'll show you uh, just the, and our assistant, he's from Sweden, he always calls these the details, one of our assistants. But these are some of the details. This first clip, this is us working on our corner kicks. So this is us, our post player right here, if you watch, he makes the save right there. That's our post player. And she's taught to come in as the ball gets to the far side to pinch in on this side of the goalkeeper. So this was a session at the StubHub Center in LA. And we're working on, on taking corners, just defending corners between our post player here and our goalkeeper here with our attacking runners at the same spot. So, so a lot of players, I've scored tons of goals in college. That ball comes across. And most of the post players just stand with their arm around the post. Okay? And they're not really covering for the goalkeeper. All right? But this is, again, this is part of the last 15 minutes. Now, here's the, goal, the corner kick against Sweden. And if you watch Megan Klingenberg, that's Megan Klingenberg right there. And you can see this. If she doesn't do her job, if she stands on that post, I watch her come inside here to make that save. So... You can see here, this is, and again, this was practiced on the, on the field, on the training ground. And she's not this, if you look at Kling, she's smaller than I am, which is saying something, and she's not a great header, but here's, here's the goal line technology is something they use for the first time in this World Cup, and this is what the, the people at the stand see, so the whole ball has got to be over the line. So here's Germany. And you can see our forwards now not allowing their center back to build out. So we're making this, we're forcing her to kick. We're forcing her to kick the ball. We're not letting them build. We're not letting get it get a tempo. We're not letting get any get a sort of rhythm in the game. Okay. Here's a free kick. This is Alexander Pop. And this is uh, Morgan will come back. There's Morgan right there. And that's Pop. You can see how big and strong she is. But she loses her for a second. This is Morgan right here. So if she's not there on that play from that range, I think that's a goal. You know, if, if, if nobody's up there to challenge her like there, okay, that's a goal. So that was the kind of sacrifice. Again, the little things that made a difference. And again, this was not something, this was something she had to change, uh, make an adjustment for game time. This is us against, this is us the day before the game, the final against Japan. And Japan plays a lot of their players inside the six on corner kicks. So we, we played a lot of, we moved a lot of players in here. We had a couple players that went forward here. So these are our two players that go forward here to try to draw some of the players out. The rest of them come in here and we, we, we wanted to bring a player in late for a ball that's driven back. That was the plan based on their players. My position, I was number four, which is Kuma guy. She's free on a zonal player. We didn't want to play her, we wanted to pick her. So kind of like a basketball pick. We wanted to send people in. That's my job there, I was just emulating Kuma guy, somebody's supposed to pick her so we can, so she couldn't get out to this player. Okay? So this was at literally, this is the game. The next day, you can see the runners go short, and here's the late runner, Carly Lloyd, finishing. There were about 60,000 people in that, in that venue, and one of the great things about being in Canada, almost every single game we played was home game for the U.S. 
The only one that wasn't was Edmonton, because that was eight or nine hours. That was in the middle of nowhere. Um, and if you're from Edmonton, I'm sorry. but <laughs> So you can see that, oops, you can see the run at the end there. Let me put that back on, sorry. Well, that was, a, that was that last play anyway. I'll, I'll maybe just click ahead. That was the last thing. The last lesson I, I think that I, I would say, in, in addition to having a plan and working a plan, adjusting the plan, is to, is, and, and also just paying attention to the details, is creating the culture. I didn't, create, I didn't say create a culture. I think it's important to create the culture, the culture that you want. Um, I think within any team, any organization, I think this to me is the most critical aspect of, of organizations and teams. Um, so our culture, these were some of the things that, that, that were important to us. Uh, being unselfish and serving the team first, it was always about winning the World Cup. So we had players, um, and I'll show you this in a minute, we had players that had played in previous World Cups, previous Olympics, didn't get much time. But the goal was to win it. And it was to be a part of the team and how could they help with that. Be highly motivated, enthusiastic in everything we did. So every, every aspect of training, respectful, respectful of the teammates, respectful of the staff. We had massage therapists, we had nutritionists, we had uh, security details, um, all sorts of staff members uh, in relation to our team, and it was, it was about being respectful to them, trusting one another. So if you, if you didn't follow the papers, there was not a lot of, we didn't play great, we didn't play that well in the first three games. There's a lot of media scrutiny on the way we were playing, um, and it was about trusting it was about our players trusting the staff and the staff trusting the players. And I think that came through. Being disciplined, just making sure you're taking care of, our players are taking care of themselves in the gap plans. Uh, no one embrace your role, both players and staff. So, you know, for me, my role was, was different than maybe the other assistant, maybe the head coach. Um, but it was just embracing that role, no matter what that was. Um, and being able to perform under pressure, that was very important. We paid our best soccer at the end when it mattered the most. Um, and competing all the time. So again, if, if you look at this picture, and I know it's a little distorted, but there's not one, you can't tell, you can't tell that this player, who's the captain, played in about 15 minutes the entire tournament. Okay? You can't tell this player didn't play at all in the tournament. So it mattered to them, and I think that made a difference for, for us in terms of our culture. Um, I think your team reveals your culture, and I'll just tell you a couple stories about the players. So Abby, um, most of you have heard about Abby Wambach. She, she's the greatest goal scorer in the history of soccer, really. Okay. Um, now, we played Abby in the beginning game against Australia because we felt it was important to get her leadership and her experience. Um, she also played in the game against Nigeria. Now, Nigeria is a fast athletic team, and Abby's getting on in age, and she's not that fast. So it wouldn't have been wise, I think, for us in the grand scheme of things to play Abby in that game. But the reason we played Abby in that game is because Nigeria had the worst goalkeeper in the world. And they're not very organized on set play plays. And she's the best header in the world. And so, again, the goal is to win. It's not to make people feel good. And so we didn't play great, but we won the game. And part of that was because of Abby's, um, you know, Abby's strengths. Now, the last three games, Abby's did not start. So who wants to take a stab at that one? To say to the best goalkeeper in the world that you're not going to start in the quarterfinal, nor are you going to start in the semifinal, nor are you going to start in the final. Anybody want to take a stab at that one? Okay, because our head coach had to do that. So what do you think she said to Abby at that time? Okay. She started off Abby, and Abby cut her off. And this is the kind of person Abby is. Abby said, Coach, if I don't start, that's not the most important thing. I'll do whatever you ask, whatever you want. How do you think our coach responded to that? Can you imagine you going up to fire somebody and, hey, okay, I understand. I'm all for the team. If that's what it takes, that's what it takes. But that's, that's the kind of person she was, and that's the kind of team we had. Um, and that's something you won't hear or learn about. Uh, Kelly O'Hara. Kelly O'Hara didn't play much in the first four games. She played against China, and she played against Germany. 
and we were up one nothing against Germany, and we had to we had to put somebody in on the flanks because we were losing the flanks a little bit. And she came in in the last 15 minutes, and she scored a brilliant goal to kind of solidify the game for us. But again, her she she's played multiple positions, okay, multiple positions. But I think just her work rate, she was the right piece for that particular game at the right time. And I think she performed a role. And the last person I want to talk about is Lauren Holiday. She recently retired. Lauren's had a great career in college, great career in the national team. Um, but what, what you won't know about Lauren is Lauren is a forward. Lauren's played all her life as a forward. She is an attacking player. In this World Cup, she played defensive midfield. In the World Cup prior to that, she played left midfield. So her whole national team career, basically, has been, she's been played in a position that doesn't, uh, uh, it doesn't, it's not her strength. Those aren't her strengths to play those positions, okay? But she did it, and she did it willingly, okay? And I think the greatest thing for me was to watch Lauren Holiday score what was the game-winning goal in the World Cup final as a defensive midfielder. So we won the game 5-2. to two. Lauren scored the third goal which for her, I think, made all the difference in the world. So you can, see these, um, you can see some of these things come out in terms of our culture um, in, the, in the video. So you can see, here's the goal against Nigeria. This was just before the half, um, and this is why Abby was in the game. This is why Abby was in the game against Nigeria. What it doesn't show, we should have, I felt in this game, I felt in this game we should have scored three or four goals off of set plays, but we just couldn't get the right service. And uh, it was ironic, because Japan, we got the right service. We didn't have many, as many opportunities as this game, but we, we got the right service in the Japan game, and we finished. Here, this was one of the few times where we connected um, with, with, with her. Yeah. <laughs> No, she'll tell you that. She's not, she's not that fast. She's strong. She's very strong. This is Kelly O'Hara. This is the, we were up one nothing against Germany. And this is Carly Lloyd. And, and this is Kelly right there. Just beats her player to the spot. So it's, 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 a, it's, you know, so much of sport is just making the play at the right time, you know, being in, in the right spot, getting yourself in it. And for her, that's her game, you know. It's a great play. And then here's the, the, the goal against uh, Japan. We were up two to nothing. That's Morgan Bryan that just passed that ball out here. This is Tobin Heath. And Tobin, this ball just gets cleared up and... Lauren just happens to find herself in the right place at the right time, and she just buries it. So that was some of her forward skills coming back to her. She's not, she's not kissing that guy. She was, she was she's blowing kisses to her husband. So, yeah. So, but for you know, this was a. It, it's a, It's amazing when you when you take a. You know, how many people watch this? 25 to 27 million fans watch this particular game. There's so much pressure on this. Um, and so for me, the, the things that I thought mattered when I look back on it as a leader are that you, you have to have a plan. You, you have to work that plan. You must adjust that plan. It's gonna, there's going to be adjustments that come up, especially in athletic teams. And then you have to believe in that plan. And there wasn't a time, I, th I think, that there, or the coaching staff, we always believed we could win it. And we just, I think we had to keep that in mind with the players. There were times where we didn't look so good. We had a great training camp in L.A. in January, and then we thought we were in a great position. We go over to France and play in a sold-out French stadium in front of 20,000 fans and, drop, and just lay an egg. We lost two to nothing. We got hammered. And uh, so, again, that tested our resolve as well. So, uh, and then the little things, I think details do matter, especially in our, in, in our, in our sport. I think it matters a, a great deal. And then the last thing, like, like I said before, is create a culture. And the, the culture, to me, the culture is, is a, it's your working environment. It's what you want in terms of working. So 
Happy to answer any questions if you want to ask questions specifically about the, the tournament or the players or anything like that. Just yeah. uh, we ask that you wait for the mic for recording purposes. So, Charlie. Thanks for your presentation, Coach. Um, if you could possibly talk about a time when you looked at either the women's national team or maybe even the Virginia team that you coach, there was a time where you looked at your players and you realized that they were ready to go, that you know everything that you had worked for had finally come together and solidified, and you looked at them and said, this is, this is what we were training for, and you, know, you kind of saw the organization as ready to pounce rather than you know, preparing for a coming tournament. If, was, were there any times that you saw that? And if you did, could you talk about it a little bit? Well, I thought um, looking at this tournament, um, the game, I, the game, in my opinion, the game that I was most nervous about was the first game, because we we were playing a very good Australia team who had, we had played on countless occasions, and uh, they were they were they're a very modernized team. They do things a little differently than a lot of teams, and they had some firepower up front. Um, we were lucky because Hope Solo made several saves in that first 20 minutes that kept us in it. But we could have been down 2 nothing in that. Um, the, the two games that I was least concerned about were the last two, Germany and Japan. And I'll tell you why. Germany had played France in the quarterfinal, and France should have won that game. Now, France was a better team, and as most people know who's played soccer, sometimes the best team doesn't win, always win. So we felt we had a, day's, we had a, a day more of rest than Germany. Uh, we knew what they were going to be like, and we, we were starting to kick into our group. So I, I felt that game, we all felt, and we were, playing in, uh, we were playing in Montreal, which was, for all practical purposes, a home venue for us. That, we were, we, that, that game was going to... And then once we won that game... I can tell you right now that I had no doubt we were going to win that. Now, I didn't think we would win 5-2, to two, but I had no doubt we were going to win that game because it was Japan. We had lost to them in the World Cup before, and uh, I think we were, again, in, in Vancouver where it was a lot of U.S. fans, so we felt very confident in those last two games. Um, I was up in the stands. I usually stay in the, in the first half. I'm up high. I like to be up high so I can see, um, and I think I can bring that information to, to our head coach at halftime. So I was always up high for the first half, but I, was, I felt like lost because we had scored four goals. I couldn't celebrate with anybody. Um, I'd forgotten, I usually had gotten a seat up in the media venue. You know, a lot of the media is up there in Vancouver. There must have, you can imagine, it's a final, everybody's there, so there were no seats. But in pre previous games, there was always one or two seats I could squeeze into, but I literally went up there and I couldn't find a seat. And uh, it was nice, there was two, two, uh, two people let me sit in between them. But every goal, I was knocking computers down and everything, and I couldn't, you know, I couldn't. For all practical purposes, the game was over at halftime. But we felt very positively going into those two games, just by the, the build-up and how we were playing and the players that we were playing. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, so in a lot of fields, uh, gender is a, is a I will call it an issue in leadership. And do you have any comments as it relates to gender and leadership? Uh, no, I, you know, I, I've been coaching women for all my life. Um, I think that, uh, I think when I, I was applying back in the day to, to men's jobs when I got out of the University of Iowa, but I ended up going to Dartmouth as an administrator. I thought I'd be an administrator way down the line but I just happened to be in the right place at the right time when the women's soccer job opened up. And uh, it, you know, it's changed my life. I'm a better husband, I'm a better father, um, I'm a better coach because I've coached women. I, I firmly believe that. I think that um, what, I've, what I've tried to do to our players here at Virginia is, I, I think all of them have leadership capabilities. Now some of them, because of the environment they're in, they may not lead as much. But I think if we can give them the ability to lead within the environments that we're at, I think the, the chances of doing that once they find their, 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 their calling in life, so to speak, um, I think that's, that's important for us as professors, as teachers. So for instance, we don't have, we have on-field captains with our program here at Virginia, but I have a leadership committee, and, I, and, and the, only, the, the way you get into that committee is if, you, if you're their fourth and fifth year, 
with some, we have some 50 years, you automatically are on that. So I just feel that their ability to be in our program for that long, they deserve a leadership uh, position. And so, now some of our players aren't gonna be great soccer players. That's not the field they're gonna be a leader in. Do you, you know what I'm saying? But they can be a leader in something else. If they have that ability to in, infect change or, or initiate change or become uh, someone that can you know, t get in leadership positions, I think it can help them. So that's kind of the thing that, 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 that I've really uh, you know, strive to do within our program. I don't, think, um, I don't think we demand as much. For me, I'd like to give them, I'd like to give them the, the power at times. I like to give our players, I call it, I give them the keys to our program. And you trust them and you believe in them and you give them the ability to lead at times. But I don't have a, you know, I don't, there's some people that I have, you know, to me, leadership is a skill. It's something that you can acquire. It's, it's also an art. But I, I think it's a skill, and I think it's something that uh, um, I don't think I was a great speaker, for instance, um, when I was a lot younger. I think I'm much better at it because I got a lot of practice at it. I'm, I'm, I'm better at it. I'm, I'm a better, better coach because of it. And I think it's trying to get, get our players and our people and our students into areas where they can exercise some leadership. Um, and it doesn't have to always be up talking. It, it can be the example they set what they say in practice, their body language. There's a lot of different ways that players can lead, and it doesn't have to be from a fourth year. It can be from a first year as well. Um, I have a question about the second half of the final. So how did you adjust after the first half and unexpectedly being up by so much after the first half? Well, I think the big, it's, the big thing for us was just making sure we, um, that we were solid defensively and that we, we didn't think the game was over after 45 minutes. Um, we did give up, uh, we did give up, a, you know, it, it got a little closer there, uh, but for all practical purposes, I mean, I'll be honest, for all practical purposes, when we scored a fourth goal, it was over. That game was over. Um, so it was just a matter of doing, the, just making sure we were disciplined and doing the things that we needed to do in the back to solidify our lead at that point. So we had practiced scenarios uh, for a long time about what, we're, what to do when we're up and uh, you know, how important it is to maybe we're a little more conservative and not sending our defenders forward, those kinds of things. But we talked about some of that. But for the most part, it was, um, you know, I think our players could feel it at that point, could sense it at that point. You know? Thank you again for your presentation. So during the World Cup, there was a lot of talk about the gender disparity between um, like the men's national team and the women's national team, whether that was um, you know, how much the money the women won compared to the men's team, um, even though they did a lot better, you know, the turf fields um, and all that sort of stuff. Do you see um, FIFA shifting towards a more gender equal playing field? Or? Yeah, as soon as they get their organization sorted out. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yes, I, I, I do, I think that's, I think that should be um, something that's on the top of their agenda. The, the, the difficulty, uh, the, the difficulty, the difference in the men's and the women's game is pretty, pretty significant in the sense that our women's national team, they're contracted by U.S. soccer. So most men's players are contracted by their clubs. They're getting their money from their clubs. So... U.S. soccer, in, in some ways, um, so that the women, so that our women can train year-round, they, they're on contract with U.S. soccer. So they're giving us a, a certain uh, salary every year. That's different than most, uh, you know, most countries aren't doing that. And they're just not. They're giving, they would give them per diem. When our men's national team goes in uh, for camps, for qualifiers, things like that, they're getting per diem. And then when they, if they win the World Cup, they would get a, a you know, their pot is much bigger. I think it's 38 million for the men as opposed to 2 million for the women. That's a pretty significant difference. Um, it's hard, for me, it's hard for FIFA to justify. So it's hard when, when you know that the men would get 2 or 3 million and then our players might get 160,000 and that's before taxes. That's hard. So I think there's for sure a disparity. I think they're well aware of it. I think, you know, I think that's something that hopefully we'll see change in. Um, but the good news is for, for, for what we're doing here in, in the U.S., it's better than almost, it's better than most countries. And I'm not saying it's ideal, it's not what it should be, but it's better. Most of our players are making more of their money out in, 
outside contracts and sponsorships and things like that. Um, and I think in many ways they're actually more marketable in that regard than maybe some, some of the men, you know. So the hard thing for me is the television because I, I, I think the TV, what, what the advertisement, the, the advertisement dollars and the, what was watched and viewed, to me that should in some way come back to the players. And I'd like to see that because that's, people are watching it, you know. And, uh, but it's, it's, it's a discrepancy that, um, you know, that's, it's, it's something from, as a coach, that would be, the, that was, that's hard for me to reconcile. Very, very difficult. You know? so. um, I was wondering if you could talk about the challenge of working with people, to um, players to address their outside conduct, that now basically to get them to understand how their outside conduct off the field affects Sort of so not, basically, the challenge of working with players whose outside conduct, sort of non-athletic conduct, could have an impact on the team play and sort of on, whether at the college or the national levels, I guess, yeah. been more I mean, that's the, the a, that's the culture piece. I mean, that, to me, that's a culture piece. Um, it's a little different for college because um, it, the environment, you, you, you're dealing with uh, young women who, you know, and you have, you have the... Uh, you have college athletics, you have the, the rules and regulations of the university and the, uh, yeah. U.S. soccer is a little different because you're, de you're dealing with players in, that could range from Morgan, who's 20, 22, to, uh, to Christie, who's 40. So it's a little different. Uh, Hope Solo is, is a unique case. Um, you know, I got involved with U.S. soccer um, about the time that that all took place. And, um, you know, I think it would be interesting to look back and see if U.S. soccer would handle it a little differently than when it originally came out. Um, but I think they, they were working with the police and, and were waiting for the police to come up with a report. Um, and, you know, it, it was interesting to see it all evolve. And it's interesting to see where it is now. Um, I think in, in some ways, you know, in all my dealings with Hope, I think Hope, Hope's been an awesome teammate and uh, is, I think, is a, a wonderful person. I think for me, it, it seems that alcohol um, is part of that. So it's, it's trying to, to figure out that equation. So it's, there's, again, there's a lot of things that the public does not see um, that uh, I think contributes. Um, but I think that's part of, I, I think part of our organization, part of U.S. soccer, I think that's, we can use the ability to be part, you know, to be part of something and to, to, to help um, guide off-field conduct. So I'm all for that. Hi, Coach. Uh, common convention would tell us that as a leader, you want to really get to know your team and put their strengths to work. The product is better. The, the team members are happier. And so would you mind sharing with us kind of the decision that you have to go through when you're deciding, deciding not to put a player's strengths to work on the field? Um, I, would, I would think that would be very difficult and counterintuitive. Yeah, I think it is very difficult. I think there are times where, um, I'll, I'll use some examples. Um, for instance, if, if we were playing a, uh, a full season. Let's say we're playing an uh, English Premier League or, or a college soccer season, which goes over four, four and a half months. Um, it might not have been a smart choice to take somebody like Shannon Box, who's 38 years old. Okay? She's not going to last over that, that time period. But when you're talking about a tournament that is played in 30 days, seven games, okay, and you're talking about perhaps she could give you 20 minutes in one or two of those games, then it becomes, then you kind of look at it and you go, yeah, maybe, because she's been in Olympics, she's been in World Cup finals, and she's got an amazing amount of experience that she can bring to the table. So it may look on the outside, well, why did you bring, why did you roster Shannon Box? Why was she one of the 23 players? Because I'm telling you, in September, when we trained with Shannon Box, I would have said, no way, we can't. she's not even ready. She just had her baby, she's, she's, she's not ready. But um, I, th I, I, so f to the outside, uh, to, to the outside world, that may have not seemed like a good decision, but to me, I would make that decision again. 
given, the, the, given what I just told you, given what I believe, given the experience of Shannon um, and what she brought to the, to the, to the team. Um, the, other thing, the other thing might be putting players in, in different positions, like a, a Lauren Holiday. But you have to understand, it is, a, it is one thing to play in front of, uh, to play here out in the amphitheater a game of pickup soccer. And it's a vastly different skill set to play in front of 60,000 people when the whole world's watching and you perform. And uh, there may be some young players who maybe over the long haul would be better than what we selected and should be, but would they perform like some of these players did in their roles, even though their roles might not uh, take into account all their strengths over somebody else? And that's, those are the questions that we had to ask. And those are very difficult questions. Very difficult questions. And you can't imagine. I remember we sat in a room for 10 hours. 10 hours thinking about the lineup that we would put up in four days against this opponent. So you can't imagine the amount of thought that goes into this and, and uh, you know, the, 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 the difficulties and the challenges that you face when you're looking at this. So, um, you know, I think the, the best thing, you know, what I'd say is, you got to believe, and you've got to trust yourself that, that you're doing the right things for those in those situations, based on your observations and based on your evaluations. I can't tell you how many parents have come to me. Well, my daughter should play. You know, my daughter should play. My kid should get an A. I, my kid works hard. Make it. No, they don't see their kid in the school all the time. They don't see their kid in practice all the time. I do. You do. You don't see their kid in work at, at work all the time. And that's where you have to trust that those things come out. And, and, and you have to believe in them that they're going to come out in front of 60,000 people. Thanks, and congratulations. All right, thank you. Thank you.